So right-wing figures like Steve Bannon, Jordan Peterson, use this term cultural Marxism to describe the so-called moral rot of our society as kind of analogous to Marxism. So first talk about what you think cultural Marxism is in terms of how they're applying it and your response to this theory. Well, you know, the irony, and perhaps there's a deep meaning to it, uh, the irony is that cultural Marxism is a derivative of a term called cultural Bolshevism, which meant basically the same thing. And this was invented by the Nazis in Germany as a way of organizing the German population to be critical of everything to the left of the Nazis. They were all either dupes of the communists that lay behind them or wittingly doing their dirty work of spreading secretly and in the schools and in the films and in the museums uh, this kind of evil Bolshevism. There's therefore some symbolic interest in the fact that Jordan Peterson or Steve Bannon would find in their minds the same phrase to play the same game, to, to argue that somehow insidiously the Democrats, liberals, everything left of where they are is somehow infected by a dangerous disease. It is hallucinatory, it's nutty, but it can serve as a way to organize people to be hateful towards those they disagree with. And it doesn't have actually have any application in Marxist theory. No doesn't come out of Marxism. Marx never discussed anything like cultural Marxism. Marxists in general haven't. The closest Marxists came to something like that was to be interested in the role culture plays in shaping capitalism. Because capitalism affects culture in various ways. You know, we're doing a program on a cultural kind of way, but it's part of the economy of our society. So they were interested in the interplay between economics and culture, and so they would do that kind of analysis, but they never called it cultural Marxism. They talked about Marxism's interest in culture, but that's really the closest they came. Mm -hmm. Seems like they're commenting on the identitarian aspect of how Democrats hijack identity politics to kind of sell the same ideas and institutions, and yes, they're just they, kind of running if, scared if, of that. Right, if you're afraid of of the inclusion in our society of African Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, gay folks, and so forth, if all of that frightens you, which it does, uh, then it's, an, it's nice to have a term that says all of the things we don't like are secretly manipulated mm. by Marxists. It's scaremongering of the crudest sort. Well, I don't know if you saw Jordan Peterson's debate with Slavo Zizek. I thought you should have been debating Jordan Peterson. I think I you did, have done actually. a great job. Oh, I'm, I would love to see that. <laughs> well, I actually did it a little bit. <laughs> Let me tell you the story because you might enjoy yeah. it. A group of faculty and students at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho, about a year ago, sent me a bizarre invitation. Bizarre only in the sense I hadn't expected it. They were having a day-long conference, students and faculty at this university, devoted to the work of Jordan Peterson, who has a big influence out there in Idaho. And would I debate him since he has said publicly that no Marxists would dare debate him? So I found this amusing. I did, I have to admit, I didn't know who Jordan Peterson was at this moment, but I liked the idea of someone saying such yeah. a silly thing. And I said, of course I'll debate him. No, sight unseen, I will debate him, you know, if we can work out the details. A few weeks later, they called me back and they said, we informed Mr. Peterson that you were, had accepted our invitation and we would have, as a featured part of this day, a debate between the two of you. Fine, I said. Oh, no, they said, not fine. He withdrew. So he was gone, but he so angered them by his, you know, acceptance and then withdrawal that they said, why don't you just come out here and analyze his work from a Marxist perspective. So I have, in this ersatz way, debated <laughs> Mr. Peterson, and that forced me, of course, to read a little bit and see what he has said and done. Well, we know how little he's actually read of Marx, so yes. maybe that's what scared him. And, and in that debate uh, with Slavo Žižek, he talks about workers and bosses, and he actually says this, Richard. He says, quote, bosses would have to be stupid to exploit their workers. I mean, what is your response to that statement and how it kind of mischaracterizes Marx's theory of exploitation of labor? It is so ignorant 
which I'll explain in a moment, that it takes you, takes your breath away because in that moment he reveals that he never read what Marxism has to say or what Marx wrote. Marx's great work is Capital, three volumes, first volume released 1867, so Peterson has had time to take a look at it. Right in the beginning, Marx explains what he means by exploitation, and it's a simple mathematical thing. If a worker during the time he or she works produces more value for the employer than the employer pays them in wages, that's all exploitation means. It has nothing to do with the common sense words, treating somebody nicely or not nicely or in a crude way. So let me give it in a simple American example. If you go look for a job with a private employer and you discuss it and you get to the point of how much am I going to get paid and they say to you, well, we're going to pay you $20 an hour and you agree to that, you know in the back of your mind what Marx is saying here. You know that the employer will never pay you $20 an hour to do something unless during that time you produce more than $20 worth of extra value when it comes time to sell whatever you're helping to produce. Otherwise, there's nothing in it for the employer, and he's not going to do it because he's a nice guy. He's doing it to make money. So if he pays you the 20 you're worth more than that to him. And in that act... You're exploited. You're producing more than you're getting. It's a kind of moment, a eureka moment, for young people when they discover this, either by reading Marx or by their own experience, because it confronts them with a stark reality. You are never going to get paid what you are worth because this system is built on there being a difference between what you add by your labor and what you get paid for doing so. That's what every company is in the business to do. So Marx was saying it's a system that exploits. It's a system built on that difference. For Mr. Peterson to then say, nobody would ever do that because it makes no sense, exposes a level of unfamiliarity, which, you know, Nobody has to know Marx, why not? But if you go around celebrating yourself as a critic of Marx and you haven't the most basic understanding, it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the premise of every worker-employer right. relationship. It's as if I went into his field. He's a professor of psychology, by the way, at, in Toronto. If I went into his field and said something moronic about Freud's ideas, he would be in the same position as correcting me, but it would be an embarrassment of me. I wouldn't do that because it's kind of ridiculous and childish. But he gets such an audience reaction from knocking Marxism in trivial ways and never debating them the way he did with me that he's never been brought up short by being exposed for the, for the fakery that he projects. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same logic as just saying, oh, CEOs would never pursue profits at the expense of the environment. That would be stupid. That's right. Who wants to destroy the environment <laughs> after 100 years of evidence to the contrary? Yeah. It's extraordinary. Well, another thing that he says, and this is the last thing I'll say about Jordan Peterson, another thing that he says is kind of justifying hierarchies, that hierarchies are biologically, you know, they're natural and that we should just accept them. What is your response when you hear this as used to justify the gross inequalities under global capitalism? My reaction is to remind everybody of how slavery was justified. We were told in the American South and in other parts of the world where slavery has existed that there was a natural, you see, difference among people. White people were here culturally and black people were down there. These were natural, these were historical. Whenever people in a dominant position uh, get nervous about the security of their dominance, they like to anchor it, to make it something other than a convention among people and rooted instead in nature, something that isn't going to change. Like the trees grow and the sun comes out, well, there are natural superiorities, and we happen to be the ones to tell you about it because we're sitting in the catbird seat at the top. For me, it is a sign of the danger of the status quo, feeling itself on shaky ground, having to lunge into some claim of nature making them the dominant player. Every group on top 
needs to naturalize. They can't stand that it's just a social convention yeah. because then it can be changed. Right, right. So it's yeah. nice to anchor it mm -hmm. in something that is unchangeable. Mm -hmm. Human nature. Human nature. The minute, the minute you hear that, you should reach for your gun. <laughs> the conversation has taken a bad turn. <laughs>